Good evening everyone and welcome to the fourth part of 
um, honorary bots, Windows, kernel, debugging, series, fourth and the last one. Okay, I can hear myself, which is perfect. So just a few notes. Uh, first of all, this is the last part and all the other parts have been already archived on YouTube. So if you missed one, you can basically just take a look. And this part will be archived as well on my channel. The second thing is that the missions, there will be a mission today. So yeah, if you solved yesterday's already, then today is going to be another one. And that's about it. So basically I'm going to switch now and let honorary bot take over. So have fun, enjoy the show and good luck. Hello everyone, this is Artyom, honorary bot, Shushkin speaking. And today we're going to talk about debug debugging the potatoes. But since WinDBG doesn't support debugging potatoes from like the scratch, you're gonna have to write a plugin for debugging the potatoes. Yeah, but I guess I'm not prepared for writing plugins today, so we're going just to switch the topic. And today's topic will basically be the physical address space, as I said before, but, yeah, you know, uh, yesterday we were talking about the virtual ad address space on Windows, and I talked a lot about my approach that I'd like to learn the environment for the programs first, right? So today's stream is uh, a level deeper on that, because we're going to talk about the environment which in which operating system works. So it's basically the hardware hardware stuff, right? So yep. And from my approach again, we're going to see what happens in the memory. And yeah, a small like remark uh, is that we're going to examine the Intel platform. So it's not ARM or something. Yeah, it's gonna be the Intel platform. Whoop. And yeah, I'm gonna show you one thing on how to find the super picture of what's going on in physical memory. Well, first of all, uh, we've been talking about virtual to physical address translation, right? So you, by now, you should distinguish the virtual memory and the physical one. Yeah, so today we're going to talk about physical one. And for that, I'm going to show you how to find the super secret data sheet of it is actually in my history. So we're not uh, going to use uh, system developers man manual because it's basically about the architecture, right? We're going to discuss if we can say a chip, which is a CPU. And for that, we're going to need a data sheet. So there are two volumes of the data sheet. Um, you have to Google it like that. So CPU data sheet, and then is uh, its generation. And because of uh, the fact that my stand actually uses Haswell CPU, uh, I'm going to show you how to define the uh, generation of a processor. So first, you're going to have to find the processor among the devices in the device manager. We can view by connection yeah so here we can see that it's a Haswell CPU it's 4570 CPU so the first number is actually a generation of the CPU so that's why I'm looking for the uh, fourth generation there are like two volumes I didn't see anything right so it, it is uh, like the first volume is about physical properties it's uh, like electrical signals and this sort of stuff, like pinouts of the processor. We actually not going to look it up. And the, the second volume is basically what we're looking for right now. So yeah, I'm going to show you is in just a second what's going on in there. So it's a super cool document which describes some properties of the CPU like the internal devices, internal registers, right? And 
what I wanted to show you about the physical address space uh, is the system address map. There's a cool picture of it. So uh, you might think of a physical memory that is just the RAM sticks which you plug into your motherboard and it is sort of linear address space, physical address space, but in fact it's not because you know the processor operates with addresses but still how would it op uh, operate with its devices with this IO if it has only like memory space yeah of course it has uh, a so-called IO space which is uh, IO ports input output ports which are programmed with the separate instructions which are in and out you may have heard of them especially if you try to Google how to program the serial port. Yeah, but here's what's going on. So to the right side of the picture is a DRAM controller view. Yeah, it's a controller with the RAM sticks plugged in. And to the left is the host system view. It's how the CPU sees these physical addresses. So we can see there are diff that there are different regions we have like Legacy address range is uh, or legacy support basically it's uh, 640 kilobytes or something. Then we have main memory add range, uh, yeah, which is I guess four gigs. It's less than four gigs because uh, the upper, uh, like uh, how do you say, it? the upper stuff. <laughs> of these four gigs are actually memory map, map devices. Uh, there are also special regions for uh, CPU operating on, in a different mode. It is so-called SMM, which is system management mode, and it requires a separate memory region, which is not accessible from any other CPU mode. Uh, yes, there's like that. And then we have a PCI memory, which is used for uh, memory map IO or programming the devices and like some sort of internal CPU devices like advanced programming interrupt controller which is APIC flash controller and yeah IO EPIC uh, IO EPIC I guess so input output uh, program uh, program interrupt controller uh, yeah and then we have so you see, if you have more than 4 gigs of memory installed in your system, it is actually, it actually has a hole which starts from somewhere from the PCI memory to like upper 4 gigs. So, and then we have this uh, hole relocated to the upper view, so it's actually reclaimed. Uh, so not to waste uh, the physical uh, RAM, you know. And then when we like uh, the RAM ends, uh, we have again a PCI memory which is like subtractively decoded to the DMI, which is direct media, uh, memory interface. Yeah, it. Yeah, I'll try to explain all this stuff today. So also. If you have an internal graphics card, which is pretty common for Intel CPUs, it has GFX stolen memory, it just uses the system memory as the memory for its graphics. But yeah, basically what CPU sees is not necessarily the DRAM all the time. It has some regions. So uh, how does the computer know what regions are there and how you manage it? Uh, it's simple, it's the firmware. So nowadays it is mostly UEFI based computers, so the firmware is the UEFI. And actually, you can look up the specifications of the UEFI. It's a really cool stuff. Uh, yeah, this, the website is uefi.org, it has specification. And this UEFI is already an environment, an environment for executing the uh, UEFI programs. 
it has also built-in drivers and also the operating system loaders are just a sort of uh, EFI applications nowadays so yeah there was this legacy thing uh, which we all know as BIOS which was programmed in real mode which is much of a burden to program but it is a lot easier nowadays because we have here uh, x64 long mode so we got flat memory one-to-one -one virtual to physical memory mapping uh, CPL 0 which is like the most privileged environment so you can do with your computer whatever you want from the start even the Visual Studio has a special target which is EFI application you can build an application using the Vis Visual Studio and some headers that you may obtain on this website and uh, also the spec about UFI and you can write your own programs to, that run without any operating system how cool is that because yeah this is what we all want to do I guess uh, so what I'm saying is that it has uh, a set of uh, services the, it has uh, boot time services and the runtime services so the boot time services might be used before the operating system loads but once it loads uh, only runtime services uh, remain so one of the boot services the five boot services is uh, get memory map as simple as that and Let's look it up in here. Get memory map. Where are you? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it has this function. So, the operating system or whatever EFI application just calls this uh, function and it returns the regions of memory with a description of what type this memory is, how long this region is, and from that, operating system knows which physical memory it can use for its own purposes which physical memory it won't touch because of the fact that it is used for EFI runtime services for example uh, which memory is bad memory for example which you can't use and which memory is for example an IO memory which doesn't really look into the DRAM but it looks somewhere else we'll see in a second where so yeah uh, back then in BIOS you had a special service that was called um, I guess E8 yeah BIOS I just don't remember which interrupt it was but BIOS come on not voice sad voice BIOS yeah it was interrupt number 15 with function E8 uh, 12 20 sorry for my English it was plenty so it was uh, kind of a function to get the memory layout on legacy systems so we got the memory layout from the firmware uh, yeah and I already mentioned that firmware holds a lot of drivers uh, in order to compute it to stop top and function properly right so uh, yeah and we have a set of devices on board on your motherboard basically uh, all the devices that are located in your motherboard are platform devices right so these devices actually reside uh, some of them reside right in CPU for example you can look them up in here um, such device as integra integrated graphics device which is your video card built in so audio controller yeah it's actually oh yeah it's the audio controller that works uh, in couple with HDMI because HDMI is not only video processing but it's also an audio processing uh, yeah so what are the devices uh, for as far as I remember it is also the uh, memory controller which is now built in the CPU so all these devices actually are actually called on core devices and we may try to look it up on core devices oh wait it's actually described in Wikipedia so 
a set of devices are there in your CPU. But then some platform devices also are located in your chipset. And how do you find uh, what chipset you currently use? You may also define it by looking up in uh, your device manager. It says Intel 8 series uh, or something, Intel 888 series. So it is Intel 8 series uh, chipset. And it has also all sorts of devices which are located on your motherboard. For example, USB controller and audio controller. What else? Uh, so a oh how do I spell that advanced host controller interface that is used to plug your hard drives for example it is also a controller which is located on board um, and I'd like to show you well I was actually I didn't realize how amazing uh, it is but still I guess everyone saw the CPU right so everyone saw the CPU chip but you know uh, this is a chipset it is also a chip and it is size of a CPU but you know the actual devices are located in here and what I was amazed about is how much different devices are fit into this signal crystal single crystal it actually amazes me it is super cool yeah and uh, how do you work with uh, the devices from the per CPU perspective? I guess I've heard something. So it's the question. This is a little late, but can someone use load service in UFI and run service as a type of attack? So he put uh, an evil code in the part of memory that does not scan after OS boot. So yeah, here's the thing. Uh, you could do that before the Microsoft, Intel, uh, Hewlett Packard and all different other different companies uh, came out and said hey we need to somehow secure this stuff and they invented the secure boot. So it's basically the technology which is based on cryptography which uh, uh, requires a signature for EFI drivers and applications to run. Yeah, you also might heard of it. So yeah, you could do that. Uh, I mean, to load a separate service. And but yeah, still, if you turn on the secure boot, nothing going, nothing harmful going is going to happen to your computer. But still, uh, if you're talking about the part of memory that doesn't scan after the OS boot, well, we can't just hide the part of the memory. You can reserve this memory and tell the operating system that is this memory is reserved for a CPI for example oh it's a little early but still you can tell that this memory is reserved and the operating system is not going to use it but still you can always map any physical address you want using like the page table mapping mechanism and if you map this region which you required, it's, uh, you will be able to see what's going on here. You will be able to see the contents of the, this memory. So there is no simple way to mask it, actually. Yeah, I said that there is a special region, for example, TSAG, or for example, UMA, which is used for manageability eng engines. So those, those regions are masked in when the CPU operates, not in the, like, SMM mode or if it's not ME platform uh, yeah but it's done in the hardware so you cannot repeat that with one exception which I promised to tell about yesterday we're going to uh, talk about soonish so what do I, was I so the chipset there is like a lot a lot a lot a lot of different devices and in just a second there was an 8 series chipset, right? So there are also data sheets for uh, these uh, chipsets. And here's an example. You can like Google it up. Intel, series, uh, chipset, and something, blah, 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 PDF. And it will be shown you. So you may see that there is a lot of 
lot of stuff going on here. So it's electrical characteristics. It's not really interesting. Register, register memory mapping, which uh, also has, I guess, this beautiful picture. Maybe not. No, it doesn't actually have a picture. It is all about tables. Yeah, fine, whatever. So the chipset configuration registers. Oh yeah, sure, I forgot the LAN is there. LPC, which is mostly used for power management. And SCPI is tightly coupled with this LPC stuff. So SATA, with, which is like exactly a controller that is used to connect your hard drives. So EEH extended host control interface is USB 2. Uh, enhanced, enhanced. The extended is the other one. It's the USB 3 controller. So high definition audio, SM bus, PCI Express, high precision event timer, which is a set of high precision timer uh, that actually can be used for as a system typer in the Windows operating system. Serial uh, peripheral interface, which is an interface to flash your flash. <laughs> like the flash is. Um, separate uh, uh it's not read only but a separate memory uh which holds the firmware yeah and where the firmware starts to execute before like uh detecting the dram models going on to execute in there so right thermal sensor registers i guess not everyone has has it so yeah as you can see there's a lot of different devices and they're all on board devices so, uh, the thing is, different chipsets have different set of devices. And if you, like, take the AMD-based computer, right, with uh, a motherboard that is suited for AMD processor, you may find that uh, there is a whole different varieties of uh, the devices on board. I'm talking about, like... You have a USB controller. If you have an Intel chipset, you will always have an uh, Intel USB controller. If you have an AMD chipset, uh, there will be like something like, I don't know, Rini sauce, for example. So, yeah. And because of that, because of the fact that there are different devices all the time, you need to somehow manage this mess. And there uh, comes the standard, which is ACPI which is Advanced Control uh, Power Interface. I hope I didn't lie to you because I'm not sure about the abbreviation. And the website for it is um, acpi.info, I guess. I thought it was acpi.org. No, it's Aviation Crime Prevention Institute. Okay, so I guess it is ACPI Info. But the thing is that I've never visited that, this site because all the documentation related to the ACPI can be downloaded from the UFI.org because these uh, specifications are tightly coupled and they refer to each other all the time. And this ACPI stuff is pretty much interesting because it's a huge specification. Yeah has some history behind that. So in just a second, hardware, hardware, ACPI, so the ACPI spec. Yeah, it's advanced configuration and power interface specification. And yeah, so it is defined as a set of tables which uh, reside in memory. And this uh, these tables are actually built uh, uh, with the firmware while the computer, while your computer initializes. And yeah, uh, let's take a look at them, what's going on right in there. And for this, I use the utility, the super cool utility, which is called Read Write Everything or RW Everything. So it is so cool that it can show us basically anything related to the hardware side of your computer. And for example, here's the memory map, the legacy memory map report, which doesn't work because I'm booted in UFI mode. Right. 
Uh, so we're now going to look at the CPI tables here. Oh, they're already, already there. Here they are. So uh, the specification uh, defines that it must reside like in several spaces. And when you get the memory map from the UFI, uh, you will find that, oh, it's like a CPI memory. So let's scan it and search for this signature. And this is where like the table, this is how the table is found actually. So, and this table that has, uh, this RSDP table is root system description pointer. It's sort of uh, legacy stuff, stuff nowadays because it's uh, a 32 bit um, related uh, table. So it has an address which uh, refers to the extended system descriptor table, right? So, and it's the place where the other tables are referenced. So it has like all the references to the other tables and there is a whole set of it. They're not only hardware defined, but they're also software defined. So uh, for example, if you're plugging an external network card, and it has like a DXC driver inside it, it may also build a separate table and add it to the existing ones because of the fact, for example, that it, ha it has like a separate ACPI code which is going to be executed by the operating system. So yeah, they are to be used in runtime. So description table is also has some references. So yeah. For example, here we have a fixed SCPI descriptor table. It has some stuff, blah, blah, blah. Uh, those are registers that I used for uh, power management. Yeah, I've been recently debugging it, and this is sort of tough stuff. But still, uh, what I want to show you is, is what do I want to show you? I want to show you the reset register, if it's there you there oh it should be in a different table it's the firmware cpi control structure but it's not there i guess it's just it is not shown in here or maybe i just don't see it so the flags define what uh, the what are the capabilities of the current processor so yeah the alarm which is used for real-time clock yeah everything is holding there it has like the ACPI interrupts, SMI port. Yeah, not interesting without the reset port. It should be described in here. Yeah, but okay, fine, whatever. The next uh, uh, page, the next table is actually the most important one while you set up your CPU because it describes how many CPU cores you have. Yeah, it's all described in there. And actually, it's called APIC, uh, which stands for, which refers to the APIC device, which is Advanced Program, uh, Programmable Interrupt Controller, which is used for uh, the cores to com communicate with each other. Yeah, so it's the device that describes a core. So, yeah, they're described in this table. So, by examining this table, we can look up how much cores are there and how much cores you're gonna have to start up while booting so it's the important one because yeah there are actually no means uh, to determine uh, how much cores and threads are there present now uh, for example yeah there are some cpu id leaves but the information there is not consistent there are also some undocument undocumented stuff uh, in a special msr but it is undocumented so it's not meant to be used right so we should really rely to this table when we start up. So the next performance is not interesting. Alert, not interesting. Trusted computer, yeah, it's for the TPM device. Nothing, nothing interesting. I'm going to skip this once in just a sec, for just like a second. And memory map configuration space based address description table. Yeah, it's the second most important table for like in my humble opinion of course and it shows us where the base address for memory mapped PCI access is so yeah 
uh, you look up the physical address and then you know how to enumerate your PCI devices which I am also going to show you in just a second so it's the special devices this is high precision event timer blah 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 stupid codes DMA remapping reporting table uh, this sort of stuff is used for IO MMU MMU which we discussed earlier about DMA attacks yeah so this is sort of stuff that is used to describe what memory regions can be dma to or from. Yeah, uh, this actually is uh, a funny one because it's boot graphics resource table. It actually holds a bitmap, uh, which, is, uh, which you may see while your system boots. For example, my stand is gigabyte and it shows the gigabyte picture. And this picture is act actually kept in here with all its parameters, yeah, on stuff. So, ACPI control structure and DSDT. I'm, I'm, just a second, I'm gonna look it up again. Maybe I will be able to find the reset register. Oh yeah, no, it says the reset register is supported, but it doesn't say which one it is. But actually it's there, it, it is just not shown in the table. Uh, the thing is, uh, it describes how to reboot your platform. For example, you have to write number 6 into IO port CF9. Yeah, and then your system reboots. It's also described in here. Because, yeah, this interface is actually used for power interface, right? And resetting or turning the device off is a part of the power cycle. So, and here's the fun part. Secondary system descriptor table and differentiated system descriptor table. Well, it is not very... Um, yeah. It actually hurts my eyes when I see here. But I'm going to show you a dump of this uh, descriptor table using the different tool which is uh, specially designed to program this uh, Satan's language. In just a second, uh, I'm gonna like look up the dump of this table. Um, dumps? No, it's not dumps. Sorry for the delay. Oh yeah, I I, I remember. Here it is. So, I sell and uh, I'm gonna show this one. Oh, it's the full version of this table, uh, which I wanted to talk about. Yeah, here it is. It has a reset register. Uh, the space ID is system IO. So yeah, access width. So it it says you have an IO port CF9, and if you write into it number six, which is used uh, with a comment. Uh, it's actually a set of comments, uh, but out, let's just say out CF, CF9, uh, 6. It doesn't work like that, but it's just an example, because you're going to have to use reg registers like AXDX for this one. But still, yeah, and it's going to reboot your computer. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, and the DSDT. Okay, so this is... Um, weird language that is actually called uh, ASL which is ACPI source language and it describes everything it knows about the platform it describes the regions of memory which we may see here this for example maps to global non-volatile storage which is a place where the environment variables for the platform are kept Right, so scrolling down and we see packages, we see devices. Yeah, for example, you are. I have a built-in serial port to it. So, for example, here it has, it has a um, hierarchic, hierar <laughs> I can't pronounce that. So it has like... this one which I can't pronounce so it attaches it is attached to the system bus right and on the system bus we have a device which is 
UR, which is UART, another like way to call the serial port. And it stores all the methods uh, that you can execute to, to control this device, right? So it has hard hardware ID status, a method to disable this device, yeah, and resources that it uses, and we see that it actually uses I.O. ports, which is 3F8, as simple as that. I use everything about this port. So actually, uh, it is good for the operating system uh, because it allows us to use the computer without the drivers for the chipset. Uh, it's just the thing that operating system has to implement the OSPM driver, which is a driver that will read this ASL code and interpret it. And it actually interprets it all the time on er er any power event. Or, for example, uh, I had a trouble with this serial port because I wanted to use it on my own for my own transport, but the operating system had a tendency to like to take it away from me and I wanted to okay I'm gonna mask the device out uh, with a hypervisor right and then the operating system tried this port and says hmm this port must be dead I'm gonna execute this dev disabled device stuff and it it just goes to the LPC controller which this device attached to and it writes like some registers to it and the port just disables it is powered off so my driver doesn't work anymore yeah so sometimes yeah it's she is a bad guy so basically yeah this is uh how you manage the platform devices mm -hmm. so uh let's get back to the WinDBG. So, as we've seen in the SCPI table, I guess there is a comment. Yes, there is a comment for WinDBG which shows us an ACPI cache. Uh, yeah, because when the operating system loads, it actually uses extensively those tables. And for that, it just makes a copy of it. Yeah, and they reside in a cache. Or not. Just a second, I'm going to check this out. And for that, I'm going to use the PDE extension. Oh, it doesn't necessarily copy it to its own like memory. Because, yeah, why should I waste it? It just maps the tables that are there in a physical memory to some system region. So, MCFG. As we have seen on this table, the PCI devices appear to be somewhere uh, at the address this one and yep we see something yeah and what is that okay let's gonna find it out and for that I'm gonna get back to the device manager and view the devices uh, by connection and you see that actually the root of everything on our platform is ACPI compliant system and it sort of says that uh, actually everything grows from the SCPI so the SCPI is the one who's in charge in here so it describes all the platform devices and among those there is a root complex PCI Express bus and actually PCI is like it's the building block, the basic building block of the system because every single device is actually connected via the PCI bus, right? So it holds all the hardware inside it. So we may see that, yeah, those, all those controllers are actually P PCI devices. So how do we manage to program them? Let's go back to Google. And we look for PCI memory mapped IO. And we see the PCI configuration space Wikipedia page. 
So there are two ways to program the PCI devices. The first one is the legacy one, uh, which uses the I.O. ports, right? Uh, by the way, you can actually use the I.O. ports. Uh, you can look up the I.O. ports using the WinDBG, for example. There are comments in Byte, in Word, in Word. And there is no input word because the access size for I.O. ports is 1, 2, or 4. So you can try, for example, input byte from the port uh, 3F8, and it says 9A. Why? It is supposed to be something that is read from the serial port. Yeah, um, why not? It is 9A. Yeah, fine, whatever. So, and there is also a comment which is out byte. out word and out word which is actually specifies you a port and something and it outputs this byte to the IO port so the one way is a couple of registers yeah but for the sake of not wasting the time we're going to use that here is, is describe this on the Wikipedia uh, it supports uh, uh, there, those are ports CF8 and CFC. So one is the, is the address and the other one is the data. Uh, actually, why not? We just uh, try to read... Well, uh, first of all, uh, the address on the PCI bus goes like um, bus, device and function. And then a certain register of the device. Uh, so... Yeah, if we look back to the device manager and um, WinDBG, please let us go and look, for example, at high definition audio controller. It says it is bus 0, device 27, function 0. So um, the size of um, the number of buses is actually different for different uh, chipsets, it actually can be reprogrammed. But I, as far as I remember, it is up to 255. And then we have, I don't remember how much devices we have. But yeah, I'm not going to, oh, I guess it's 32. Yeah, 32 devices and 8 functions. So this device is actually resides at this address. Let's like try the other device, for example, jam controller. It is zero zero zero. Hmm, nice. And what about you? It's zero twenty eight zero. But you got that. Uh, the thing is uh, that if you have a platform device which is built into your motherboard, it will always have the zero bus. And uh, on this stand, I have a separate uh, USB controller. I'm going to find it in just a second. Oh, it's not powered in, I guess. Uh, then I'm going to look up the... Wow, oh, where is that? PCI root complex. USB, USB. No firewire, but it has to be there. I guess I have disabled it or something. Where is that? Yeah, fine, whatever. Uh, what I wanted to show you is that if you have a separate device, by, by that I mean if you have a separate network card plugged in into your PCI slot, it will appear on a different bus. Oh, yeah, 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 I realized. It is because of the fact that it, is, it resides on a different PCI bus, you have to set up the PCI to PCI bridge. Yeah, and there where it lives actually. Here's my device and it resides on bus 100. I guess I've heard the question. I'm going to look it up right now. So, why is integrated Intel graphics listed in PCI devices since it is built in CPU? It is managed by PCI controller on motherboard. Yeah, it's a good question actually. It, it is not managed by the PCI bus, but for the sake of uh, mm, programming comfort, so to say, it is also shown as a PCI device because, you know, it is sort of standard way to program the devices nowadays.
So that's basically why they uh, reside in the PCI con configuration space. But yeah, for example, uh, we see, we've seen that zero uh, x cf eight is used for address. Let's just output the word to it with zero, uh, which is set to a bus zero function zero, a bus zero device zero function zero and zero register, and then input word for from CFC. Uh, it's not going to work, yeah, because it don't actually remember by heart on how it is programmed. Uh, if you get all the FFs, then it 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 is it means basically that you missed memory because if memory transa transaction fails, it give it gives you all Fs. Yeah, that's the way it works. Uh, yeah, just a second. Where did I see that? So. Configuration space address port and configuration space data. Okay, 32 bit word by combining it. So I've set up the address by writing zero to it. Maybe I should also write zero to this one. Just a simple experiment. Uh, no. No, it doesn't work. Yeah, fine, whatever. I guess I, I can return it later. Or maybe never return. Why would I use the legacy mechanism? The mechanism which is super cool is memory mapped. Yeah, and it was that address actually that we've seen. Yeah, so here's the first device. And if you look at the memory, there are some bytes, but actually they make sense. And here's the picture of what those bytes actually mean so there is a device id vendor id let's look it up so it's vendor id is 8086 which stands for intel of course and the device id is c00 um, and some sort of pci stuff which is really irrelevant and uh, the most relevant part here is the base address registers it's the registers that specify the MMIO address, which is used to program this device. Yeah, because different programs, uh, different uh, controllers, I mean, have different set of registers and they are programmed differently in a different way. So, for example, um, where was I? For example, if we take, what do we take? USB extended host. Uh, host controller interface it says it resides on a device device what device 90 uh, 29 so and here's the thing that you may remember if you need to so we have the base of the PCI configuration space and then we add to it uh, the space that occupies uh, a bus. So um, here's the thing: uh, one function occupies a page. So there are eight functions on the device, which means that device occupies eight pages, right? Uh, and uh, there are 32 devices on one bus, which means then that you occupy this much bytes in the memory mapped space, right? So, what I'm doing, plus this one, plus uh, 29 times 8 pages, plus 0 times this one. And it says, physically read, physical read uh, failed. It happens because we have to specify what caching we're going to use when accessing those memory. And memory mapped uh, devices and this I.O. memory has to be accessed with uncached. So cached is not to be used when accessing uh, the MMIO. So we have to specify that it is uncached. And somehow I missed. Oh, it's because 29 is decimal, right? Just a second. Formats 29. Oh, I forgot to place a comma. 
Okay, while it loads, simple. As a result of a typo, I'll try to answer the question. Is Artem's name uh, pronounced with ye yeah or yo or ye? Yeah? How do you properly say it? Okay, here's the story about that. My name, notepad, just a simple notepad. Oh, in Russian is Artem. It is read as Artem. And this is my actual name. But because of the fact that uh, they used to um, type uh, the other letter, so they didn't use the letter yo in the documents, so the government just types in ye, yeah, which turns my name into Artem. And yeah, <laughs> but I got used to that and I don't really care. I guess I can guess this one. So that basically what happens in Russia so formats 29 it is no I have to all right I have to use a calculator uh, 29 it's 1d so let's try again uh, we place 1d instead of yeah and here we see that it is 8086 and let's check out the device ID if it's the right device ID. And it seems to be the right device ID. It's 8C26. It's 8C26. Yeah, we got the right device. And at the offset, uh, 10, 16 decimal, we have the address of the base address register. And it resides somewhere in this I.O. space. And we can look up what's in there. So all the accesses by the specification of uh, PCI uh, have to be four bytes in length, right? So that's why we access it as it were. And here we see some registers, some reference to the other memory. Actually, uh, because of the fact that I actually programmed the USB controllers, I know that it's, a, it's an array of USB ports. And we can see that those ports are actually powered on and there's a device connected and identified on this port. Yeah, and this sort of stuff. This list I used for getting the actual data from the devices. Yeah, but how do I know all of that? As simple as that, you just look up the specification. So you look, like, uh, you look for extended host controller specification. And we get the first link the first link in Google so yeah here it is and this is how we basically uh, find out what's going on there just in just a second I'm gonna find the host controller operational registers yep here they are so we see that at the start of the base address registers those are like the register that are used to program this this controller so yeah and the programming of, of, of the device actually goes like that you write something into memory and you read something from memory and when you read or write something it has actually side effects it actually sends some transactions uh, which uh, tell the device that you have to do something um, or you don't have to do something but yeah basically the programming of the devices as are as simple as that yeah because yeah many people think that it's something horrible and super hard but in reality it's not that hard you just look it up look up those bits and like write something in there everything works just fine so and here's actually the example I'm not going to show you an example with serial port although it, it is super easy but I have a serial port disabled now, so it may take a while to reprogram it. And I wanted to show you that you can actually connect with this guy, type something in, and then read this something from the uh, from this I/O port, which is supposed to be there. Yeah, but in order to do that, you first have to set up this device. Yeah, which is done. In like five steps but yeah I have like an alternative to that experiment 
uh, which I was going to show you and it's the basic uh, programming of the graphic card so in fact it is really simple so in order to do that I'm gonna have to break in at next boot oh first I'm, go I'm gonna have to see where the graphic card is uh, reside resided but yeah I don't really have to look it up always in the device manager because uh, WinDBG is super cool and it has an extension which goes like this. So PCI and it enumerates the PCI devices uh, in this case for bus zero. But yeah, but it's I'm fine with that. So here I see that the VGA compatible controller, which is a graphic card, is located at device two. All right. Hmm. Remember the reset port? Yeah, this is something I'm gonna do right now. So, in order you to be able to see what's going on in here, I'm gonna output a byte to the port one uh, oh CF nine. Um, what was the value in the SCPI, which is supposed to reboot this one? Six. And I can hear that actually it's, it's went down, but let's see what happens in the VNC because it doesn't doesn't actually care or it does. Oh no, it actually rebooted. Yeah, so that's the way it works. But the downside of this method, though, that uh, WinDBG is now out of sync <laughs> with the debugging session, so I'm gonna have to restart it in just a second. Yeah. And I was going to show you this fun stuff about the video card. So I got the menu and I should be able to connect to it now. One, two, three, four. Come on, connect. 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 Come on. Oh, okay. Uh, then you gotta break in at next boot. And I'm gonna boot this one. And it connected. At the debug service but it's not what I want I want uh, the kernel yeah winload is a is an application which actually actually loads the operating system and it's it is also an EFI application um, yeah it connected and we have a logo in here right so let's look it up again PCI oh it already works now so I'm gonna look up the address again. So DD uncached uh, the base plus zero times uh, this much. I don't know how to say it in English. Uh, two times the device size, and that's enough actually. Um, well, let me... Did I? Oh, physical memory failed. Why? Why? Because the memory is not initialized yet, right? We have to do the mm in its system first. Okay, I guess it is because of that. Yeah, the memory subsystem is not yet. Okay, I'm gonna let it go for a second and then break it back again and try again. Yeah, and it works now because the memory subsystem is already initialized in the kernel. So we got like two regions. Let's look up what's in there. So the last byte actually specifies if it is a memory mapped space or it's IO mapped space. So for this one, we use comments like in and out. And for this region, we actually use moves. Why do you puzzle me? So let's look what's in there. So it is also uncached because it's, it's memory ma mapped IO and those are zeros. Okay, look. Uh, what I'm doing is trying to find the linear frame buffer because the operating system graphic driver has not initialized the video card yet uh, to its specific mode of operation. So uh, when the video card starts, 
uh, when the computer boots it is in VSA mode which is somewhat standard yeah and it actually uses the linear frame buffer and this is this actually resides in this one or in this one I guess it's this one ah fine whatever we're gonna check it just by doing this we're gonna enter bytes uncached at this address and we're going to enter all apps oh no no not like that like this yeah a small hint you can enter multiple bytes when using enter command yeah has written something let's yeah and here's the thing those are the F's I just typed in so this small I don't know how to say yeah, small line is actually produced by simply writing those bytes in there yeah as simple as that so programming hardware is not that difficult as you might see yeah of course uh, when the operating system boots it, slow, it loads the graphic drivers uh, so yeah it loads a while so, I look up in the chat and, and, and someone asked it's e, if it's a VGA driver no it's not VGA VGA is different mode and programmed in a little different way but it's not used uh, nowadays yeah it it was used for like legacy stuff for example in BIOS it had a small resolution which is 640 or 480 yeah but the VSA mode allows us to use higher resolutions and more colors so that's why basically it's used yeah it's it is also a mode uh, that is used for example for drawing the blue screen of death because yeah how do you draw the blue screen of death if your video card dri driver fails yeah so you have to switch uh, the graphic card to the VSA mode VESA mode and operate with it as if it was just a frame linear buff buffer so we gotta check again what's inside the linear buffer once the operating system loaded and actually it still has those F's which I entered but if you look at the picture there is no white line yeah this is because of the fact that the video card actually uses different mode which is specific to this very graphic card yeah you know all the graphic cards have a different register interface so actually Intel graphic cards has some documentation and actually works uh, like it uses styling so it has a lot of small squares and there's a graphic engine uh, in it which uh, does the transformations of the squares and so the whole picture you see is made of like small squares which are managed by the hardware of the graphic card so that was actually a brief description of the topic oh no 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 yeah the most important part which I forgot to tell you about yesterday you already know everything right but still just to recall the points where the hardware meets the software so we already know that uh, there are some you know parts of program for example uh, the code is tied to the pair of registers CSREP right the stack is located in here so it's the places uh, which allow you to define where's the code and where's the stack so once you get the contact context you already know that it's RIP so it's the code so we can disassemble it and RSP is the region of memory that's used for the stack it's the simple one right but yeah about those FS and GS registers we talked about uh, the uh, operating system structures yesterday and actually uh, I showed you that there are such structures as thread environment block 
and process environment block but yeah uh, those two registers are the exceptions in x64 x64 mode because they actually can have a non null base and this base is actually can be specified in multiple ways it can actually be loaded from the segment descriptor which we observed yesterday right and from the model specific specific register which is i as far as i remember uh we have a special comment read msr which is c Zero 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 zero. Where is where is the result? No such MSR. Oh yeah, sure. Because it's like this. No such MSR. Did I type something wrong? Oh no, it's it's hundred. Yeah, of course. I guess. Yeah, but just to make sure, I gotta look it up, the uh, software developer's manual, which has a separate mo uh, volume now for model-specific registers, and we have to look up the FS base register. FS base. Yeah, yeah, it was the 100, actually. So, yeah, this is the base that is loaded into... Uh, the which is used for the FS reference memory references, so to say. So when you type something like FS zero, it actually takes this address. And yeah, why am I am I even saying about this one? The reason uh, were pretty much they're kept uh, like that. Uh, the reason why they're using non-null base is actually that they are used for this uh, thread environment block. And on Windows, register GS is used for thread environment block. And I think it's natural because we have a per uh, context RSP register which references the stack. And then we're going to have to somehow define the memory region that is private to the very own thread, right? So in order to do that efficiently, not to just hard code so some address, we, we can use just a separate register, segment register, and reference it uh, with uh, like that. So GS is used for referencing the thread environment block, which in turn from its structure can be referenced to the process environment block, which in turn can enumerate heaps, GDI tables, and and on and on. So yeah, this is how you stick to the hardware. The FS register is used also for thread environment block, but for Windows on Windows subsystem. Those are not squares; they're just shifted uh, digits. So yeah, so if you have a 32-bit application, actually it's 32-bit thread. Uh, environment block is located at this register. Yeah, but once we're in kernel, uh, those registers actually mean uh, something different. And yeah, let's look up the this one. Oh no 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 no, this one. So it points somewhere. Ah, first of all, this MSR is GS base. GS base. So it's the place where this points to. It points to this one, right? And what's in there? Let's take a look. Yeah, there is some, some data in it. And actually, it's a structure which is PCR. Let's compare the results. Yeah, the address is the same. So it is a processor control region, which is a sort of thread environment block but in terms of kernel, uh, it uh, defines the current core. So the like the unit of uh, threading in the core in the kernel, I mean, is not a thread, but it's the core itself. So it's processor control block, which is specific to the very core. For example, if we switch the core. It's, it is going to be a different address. Yeah, 
And if we map it to the structure, which is MT APCR, you can find different like useful stuff. For example, GDT, which is specific to this core, TSS, which are pretty much control structures of uh, the protected mode, right? But yeah, it also has PRCB, processor control block, which is more relevant to the kernel structures. So the first one was more relevant in terms of sticking to the hardware, of addressing the control structures. Yeah, but this one is more about the kernel. So minor version again. Oh no, what's what is that? Minor minor version of what? Ah, uh, it's CPU, CPU type, CPU uh, model. Yes, first per physical processor. It's eight. What? Eight. But still, yeah, <laughs> that doesn't make sense me because I thought I had only four yeah because it's core i5 but yeah okay it's epic mask mask mm, yes yeah, some sorts of different stuff but what I what is uh, important here is that it has a reference to the current thread so that's the way it determines the current running thread and from the thread which is K, uh, with the, which is e thread structure you can reference, so from the kernel, you have a PCR, which points to the PRCB, which points to current thread, which points to current process. And this is how we were not about to get lost in the kernel, because you have, uh, you always have something to stick with it, right? So yeah, I forgot to mention about it yesterday, but it's, I guess it's somewhat important uh, how do you stick your um, model to the hardware so yeah I guess I guess what do I guess I guess uh, I've described almost everything I want about the physical address space and the hardware and yesterday I was going uh, I like promised to show you my hypervisor debugger so it's the second part which I'm going to talk uh, in just a second. But uh, yeah, if you have any question about this part, I guess it's time to like ask them. So question, by the way, is there a possibility to debug an in kernel mode locally? I mean on the same machine. Yes, it is with one exception. It is called a live debugging and you can configure your machine for live debugging. But all it uh, does is it actually allows you to read write memory read write io space read write msrs view different structures view different like in memory objects but it doesn't allow you to manipulate the state of the machine uh, which means that you cannot stop your machine because once you stop everything is frozen and how do you interact with the frozen machine the question so uh yeah there is such thing as live kernel mode debugging but yeah it has some limitations which is pretty much natural so i'm gonna type some comments in my raspberry so about that debugger okay i'm gonna re refer to the github GitHub. GitHub. So yeah, so as you might notice, there are no source codes for that. Uh, the whole project consists of several parts, and the this one is the hypervisor, which is to be launched on the target, and there are no source codes codes for it because I don't want it to be misused somehow and also I want to like still maintain the control of the source code yeah uh, so but you know it's not that I'm greedy or something I can share my knowledge with no problem if you ha have any questions on like hypervisors or something uh, so the second part is pulsedbg.executable which is like a user mode program which is used to connect to the target 
And this one goes without source code because, come on, I can show you. It is called Katusha. The internal name is Katusha. So, yeah, you just look at that. This is some actually really crappy code. And yeah, it is because of the fact that I decided to write it in C++, but actually without any knowledge about C++. So it is like super ugly and like I'm, I just cannot open source it because no way I would be like feeling like a fool. And there is a special configuration utility, which is pretty handy if you have to change some parameters uh, of the hypervisor uh, before you like start using it. I heard some question, I guess. Um, what do you do for a living? In exact, where do you work? What do you work on? Okay, I currently work, I've been working for a company which is Positive Technologies. Uh, yeah, for quite some time. Uh, yeah, it's basically my job. What I do there is some sort of secret, but it is related to Windows reverse engineering and it is somewhat related to uh, hypervisor programming. Yeah, but uh, this one, the debugger hypervisor is my own project, which doesn't like correspond anyhow with my current job. So, sort of like that. Yeah, so we got this one. So why it is called like that? First, you may notice that this is an EFI application. So it is something to be bootloaded from. And it's called like that because the default boot, boot, boot uh, file, uh, which resides on the GPT partition of, like, for example, if I use the flash drive, I do something like that. I create, like, a directory which is called uh, EFI boot and boot x64 EFI and then when I plug it into the computer it actually boots uh, from there and I can actually show you that in just a second so we got this configuration utility pretty handy for like routine stuff so it is there is no configuration applied so I'm going to show you how to debug the computer and I have several transport. I've implemented the serial, firewire and USB debug cable. So I'm going to use the firewire since it's like the most performant one. I guess there is no such for uh, such a word as performant, but yeah, I guess you understood. So here you have to do to point the address, which is the PCI address we've been talking about today. But if you don't want to, you have to just check the auto and the hypervisor will find it automatically. These two params, you can actually ignore them. Yeah. Um, so there is pretty much of the documentation in my wiki, so you may find useful information about the, those two fields. And like this is the field that is used to operate. Okay. No matter. I've specified that I'm going to debug it using the firewire. Apply. Success. Whoa. Cool. And I'm gonna stick the USB drive into the stand. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, I did that. So, where are you, my friend? Oh, it's frozen in WindyBG. WindyBG, please let us go. Please. So, um, as you might guess or not, it's the bare metal hypervisor. So it doesn't use any operating system stuff. Uh, it just operates on bare metal. So all the drivers, all the system specific stuff, I had to write it basically from the scratch. So yeah, and um, actually, it uses hardware virtualization, as I said, and but uh, most of people think uh, of the virtualization as something like you have a manager of virtual machines, you create different operating system inside your own one, you manage them, you shut down them, you launch malware and this sort of stuff. But actually, this is not the case for this one because it actually 
uh, does what is called a blue peeling. So it turns your current system into a virtualized environment. Yeah, and there are some useful stuff which are brought by the VMX technology which can be applied to the debugging purposes, which is what I love very much about hardware virtualization. What should I press? F7 or F12? It is actually misleading. So uh, it's the UFI based loader, right? So you have to have a system which is UFI based, which, which supports the UFI boot. The actual operating system does to have, doesn't have to be UFI because there is such thing as uh, compatibility support mode in the firmware which allows us to boot legacy operating system so first you're gonna have to load the uh, this so-called hypervisor debugging it says oh it's the firmware with F in here but it's not my fault it's the firmware it says I'm loading the core he builds some page tables initializes the device do some sort like, of specific stuff yeah, and because of the fact that there are 32 gigs of memory, oh no, not only that, it is also waiting for the input from the client part. And here I specified that I use the firewire on channel zero, and it says, okay, here's like your, some debug output, it doesn't really matter what that means. So it builds, and it says, load success. And then it proceeds to, why? Why do you proceed to boot from the network? Uh, it doesn't matter. So uh, here I am at the boot menu by, by now. And actually, I can use the debugger already. So how it works? It just sends the comments to the target and the hypervisor pulls them and replies. That's basically it. Just exactly like the kernel debugger of WinDBG, right? But the difference is that it actually operates in a different mode. So the CPU actually switches to like VMX root mode. Hey, are you there? Yeah, and as usual, when there is a time for a demo, everything stops working. Come on, please break in. Uh, the reason of a bug actually is a specific uh, of how a firewire driver on Windows work. I actually have a note about it in my wiki pages. Yeah, but still, here it is. So, yeah, that's basically what happens on the CPU right now. We have the first core, which is actually halted in the firmware, so it's not started by the operating system. So, it is still operating in the UFI mode. Uh, in the UFI application, and it is a single-threaded environment which operates on core zero, which I am able to switch to, and yeah, here it is. It does something. So there is a special feature of VMX which is called monitor trap flag, which allows us to step the code inside it. Yeah, and using the fact that I know something about the window internals, about PE formats, I added some useful comments like, for example, load current model. Well, it doesn't matter. So, uh, it's not really like relevant what uh, syntax I use because it was just sort of proof of concept program. It's, it is never meant to be like shown somewhere. So sorry for my syntax. It's just random stuff. So yeah, I detect the be executable and if there are re any reference to the uh, debugging symbols I download it from the Microsoft server and then unpack, parse it and voila here we got that it's boot manager firmware, it's EFI icon it reads through blah, blah, blah. so it's the function basically that reads the keystrokes yeah so it's the way like we can actually I don't know what else you can do you can read write MSRs read write memory and some sort of different stuff yeah and for example yeah the example is setting a breakpoint for example we can set uh, with this tool a breakpoint where the WinDBG can't 
and I'm talking about root and g and where I guess it's transfer oh no x find oh I'm doing something wrong boot mgf w transfer okay I'm not sure about the name of the function what's going on uh, xf transfer come on transfer yeah it, turn, it looks like I forgot the comment okay let him boot let's try to break oh no why did you get in here I don't want to use you I want to use you and here's a transport lagging a bit come on stop 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 please stop well it's not too okay we've stopped where are we now we're in the win load yeah cool we're in the win load application and from here I can actually try to find the this magic transfer function and somehow I cannot okay it seems that I have broken something down in my symbol engine so from now I cannot really like find the function which uh, transfers the execution from the win load application to the kernel application so yeah I'm gonna show you a <laughs> different case of using the break breakpoints so yeah actually I'm just going to boot right now yeah if you have any questions you can also ask me now yeah it's a little demo and showcase something broke down oh it's stuck in yeah it's stuck in here break so the operating system is loading now I'm hearing some questions so uh, whoa, whoa. is the WinDBG kernel communication open source I mean can I write my own debugger without need to reverse it no it's not open source so you have to reverse engineer the product it's actually my case because I've been using WinDBG for too long and I find it not very comfortable to use in some uh, cases so I wanted to reverse engineer the KD protocol and write my own engine yeah but I ended up with programming the hypervisor and my own <laughs> debugging engine so yeah you have to do some reverse engineering does Artem stream on his own channel on a regular basis or publish some paper um, I used to but yeah I don't do now because yeah it's a sad story actually I won't be able to stream like starting from October yeah because because some secret stuff I can do regular streams if you ask me for some topic to stream because I find it stupid if I sit down to program some stuff and stream it who would, who would look at this like is it really interesting when someone sitting stupid looking into the code and trying to come up with some idea so I'm not sure like if you have a topic I will do the stream like uh, do you play CTFs if so what team I used to play a couple of CTFs in a team called Techno Pandas, which was like a team from Positive Technologies. But yeah, actually, not really keen on CTFs. I'm a lazy ass, so I don't play them. I write my hypervisors, and I'm happy about that. So I did also some extensions uh, like Bang Windows, which detects Windows, like Bang process enumeration and it says it is only system loaded and yeah about that linear frame buffer I guess I can do the following so I have a script built in here that allows us to make the screenshots while in the video card is in the linear frame buffer it says screenshot saved ok and I'm gonna look it up test BMP so it looks like yeah something works the idea is simple you just read the bytes and for the BMP file out of those bytes right so for example where are we now where are in hardware abstraction layer and for example come on get out of here get back to the kernel 
I guess it's the kernel. For example, uh, yeah, the breakpoints, they actually work. And you can use it like this in P kernel multiprocessor. For example, x allocate bool with tag. And bang, there's a breakpoint at this address. Pretty much standard functionality for the debugger. Yeah, the good part uh, about the hypervisor debugging is that you can actually hide those breakpoints. There are still a software patches, like I insert the CC byte, which stands for I, uh, interrupt 3, which all the debuggers do. Yeah, but you can trap memory accesses using the VMX. It is not uh, now really like in release state, this feature uh, about hiding the breakpoints, but yeah, I got it working. Uh, like I will add it to the features anytime soon. So, um, yeah, I've shown the breakpoints. I've shown that you can, oh yeah, one cool feature about the debugger actually. Uh, because of the fact that um, I'm stepping the guest operating system by not modifying the R flex registers, I'm not touching the uh, trap flag register, which would be also a detect. I can, uh, I can suppress interrupts and I can allow them to happen. So it is interesting because you can observe how hardware interrupts work. Uh, right here, I'm in the clock interrupt notif notification routine, so it means that the clock uh, just ticked and I fell into an um, uh, interrupt service routine. But yeah, once I get out of it, in just a second, I hope, accumulate ticks, interrupt notify, uh, the interrupt. Um, ends with iRed instruction, which returns from the uh, interrupt and enables the interrupt flag, right? So it's the key call service routine. And perform end of interrupt right into the APIC, right? So just a second. Oh, here it goes. So it's an end of interrupt. It's iRed queue. So we return from it and bang, a new interrupt because of the fact that I can like allow them to happen and that's actually how you can debug the interrupts this is from my point of view an interesting feature and it's all because of the VMX and I heard some question in your debugger you showed it can make screenshots can you do the same reverse way put a bitmap to the memory of VGA graphic yes I can I don't have a script for now but I used to do that yeah it's like no problem it actually uh, pretty much depends on the transport because if you use a serial it's very slow transport but if I use the USB to test this one and it took me a second to draw a frame on the screen Full stop, how do you automate the debugging in the hypervisor mode? Uh, does he need this feature? So, uh, the hypervisor works like this. In just a second, I'll show you the project. So, you set up all this system stuff, and then it acts like a DLL, actually. It reacts to some events. For example, uh, here is the like the switch that handles different events. So it reacts to the init signals, CP signals is for the processor starting uh, for write, read MSR, and EPT violations. Those are the tweaks that allow us to interrupt the guest execution and handle this one in a debugger. So for example, if uh, we have such feature as VMX preemption timer, which allows us to make uh, an exit to the hypervisor uh, over, after a small amount of time. Like it is adjustable. And yeah, here you see the code. It, it is as simple as that. So we handle the stuff that is related to this VMX timer. And then we handle the debug event where we pull the packet, which came from the, the client. So yeah. So I utilized this reaction to certain hardware events 
to suit them for debugging purposes. Here's, by the way, the monitor tap trap flag. And you see, if it's in a single step mode, then we handle events. Otherwise, it might be like special cases for, uh, for example, like continuation of execution. So yeah, it works just like that. And it also implements uh, just the basic stuff. For example, I'm gonna show you like header file. So for now it implements this set of comments. So it get the context, the CPU context, read memory, write memory, IO, CPU state, CPU ID, set break, read MSR, search memory, uh, like page walk, and basically that's it for now. Yeah, but I'm surely going to extend it. So yeah, it, it is just it just does some very basic and simple stuff and all the complicated stuff I prefer to program in here because it is easier to debug because yeah, there are no means to debug the bare metal hypervisor except of, I, I don't know, like prints, prints to the serial port for example, which is uh, pretty annoying. Yeah, so this is the way it works. But the fire tra firewire transport actually fails sometimes. Yeah, and it is annoying. <laughs> so, uh, does your hypervisor inject any guest code or is everything done in hypervisor mode? So, the idea behind this debugger is uh, not to be detected by the guest. So, I do not apply any patches uh, except of the breakpoints to the guest. So yeah, because if you use a debugger, it al alternates the environment which it debugs. Even the kernel mode debugger, uh, which I showed yesterday, it uh, like changes the environment so you can detect that you're de being debugged. So yeah, the cool stuff uh, about the hypervisor that you can like you can not to touch anything that will change the environment. So yeah, it won't be detected easily. There are the ways to detect it actually, but uh, yeah, there are way less compared to the ordinary debugger. So yeah, it doesn't inject any guest code. Did you implement Windows related stuff yourself or are you using volatility stuff? Uh, I'm actually using the debugging symbols. So yeah, I know that's using the volatility is one approach, but it's more signature based, based as far as I know. But here I download the symbols from the Microsoft server and then I look up the uh, like the variables, the structures, and from there I work like with the debugging symbols. It is actually the same way as WinDBG works. It is also a symbol debugger. And I am annoyed. Why it doesn't it stop? Test Oh, stop. Okay. So, I guess I'm not sure what to show <laughs> else. So, you have seen everything, even the source code. So, yep. Yeah, if you have any more questions, then I will try to answer them right now. So I do this project in my spare time, so it is not like super fast in development all the time, but yeah, when I have time, well, let's say it like that. If I have a choice to go like walk around somewhere or to develop some code, I will prefer to develop some code. Yeah, but yeah, since it's not my full-time project, I do the best I can. So. Uh, oh, asking if there are any more questions. What, what, what? Any more questions? Will there be a challenge in that uh, question doesn't actually relate to me, I guess? So, I guess if there are no questions left, then I can pass it back to Gimwal. So, Thank you everyone for coming to the streams. I enjoyed it very much. Thanks Ginval for inviting me. It was an honor. <laughs> so yeah, if you have any questions, you can always contact me, like ping me on Twitter or something. And yeah, 
have a nice time, have a good night, and I will wish you the best of luck. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Honorary Bot. That was awesome. In all honesty, that was, that was my favorite part because I learned quite a lot of stuff today, especially around ACPI and so on. I never touched it, I know that it exists, but I never had any luck playing with it yet. So, yeah, and I learned a couple of cool applications like the ri read write everywhere and your hypervisor debugger. Really awesome stuff. So, thank you very much for streaming. If uh, anyone has any questions for uh, Honorary Bot, you know, you can find them on Twitter, for example, so nothing is lost if you were not present live or if your question wasn't passed, because I missed if I did miss any questions, then I'm sorry, but I don't think I did. So yes, that's about it for today. Um, the next stream will be basically like a summary of the missions because I didn't do one before, like before these streams, before this videos, right? So, um, yes, that's about it. I'm going to leave you with today's mission and I wish you, as always, happy hacking, have fun, and again, thank you to Honorary Bot, that was really epic. So, thanks, and I'm going to leave you with the mission and some music. Bye bye!
Watching seasons change.